وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We begin with the praise of Allah and we ask Allah to exalt the mention of grand peace to our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to his family and his companions. We're still talking about this topic of tarbiyah as it relates to our children. And what I would like to talk about now are some ahadith that we can extract from them and ayat. We can extract for them from them principles in tarbiyah. And I'm going to ask everyone watching this video at home to help me out with this, inshallah ta'ala. And to try, inshallah, to, uh, each time we mention an evidence, we mention an ayah, we mention a hadith, I want you to have a think about it and try and have a think about what are the principles or the, the things, the essential things we can take in terms of how we raise, nurture, and prepare our children. So principles as it relates to tarbiyah. The first is the hadith of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu ardah that he said, خَدَمْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ عَشْرَ سِنِينَ فَمَا قَالَ لِي أُفٍ قَطْ وَمَا قَالَ لِي لِشَيْءٍ صَنَعْتُهُ لِمَا صَنَعْتَ وَلَا لِشَيْءٍ تَرَكْتُهُ لِمَا تَرَكْتَ Al-Hadith. The hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Anas رضي الله عنه that he said, I served the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم for 10 years. And he never said to me, Uf, not even once. And uf is the smallest expression of displeasure that a person can show. The smallest thing, it's like a tut. Like when you say, like that, you tut to someone. It's the smallest expression of displeasure. The Prophet never said to me uf even once. And he never said to me when I did something, why did you do this? Nor did he say to me when I didn't do something, why did you leave this? Okay, this is our first little mini test. Have a pause of the video, have a chat. If you've got people watching this with you at home and discuss with one another, how do you think, what, what are the usul, that what's the asal or the principle or the qaid we can take from this hadith, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So inshallah ta'ala, you had to think about that. The principle that I think you can take, and there, there's more than one way of wording it, um, but here we need to distinguish between two things. We need to distinguish between matters of the religion, and in matters of the religion, you need to be firm with your children, and you need to make sure that they are clear about what the limits are in that regard. But here, when it comes to personal matters, when it comes to personal matters, don't be hard on your children for matters that are not matters of the deen. I, they are not matters of the halal and the haram. They're not matters where the child has fallen into a haram, but they're matters which are personal matters. You know, maybe they, they uh, chose something or they, they decided to do something. They made a decision and it's not a matter of haram. It's a personal matter, something you ask them to do. You say, bring me one of, bring me something. Bring me some food from the kitchen, surprise me. And they brought the wrong kind or they brought something you don't like. It's not a matter of haram. In these matters that are not matters of haram, don't be hard upon your kids. Don't say to them or try not to say to them, why did you do this for? Why didn't you do this for? Oof, you know, why is this? You know, when you get angry with your kids about things that don't are not important in the sight of Allah. The Prophet used to get angry when it was a matter of the rules and religion, the rules of the religion, the rules and the laws of Allah. He used to get angry. And he would express his anger and his displeasure. We've already heard the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha when the Prophet saw there was uh, some horses with wings. And the Aisha had made, had a curtain and it had horses with wings, the images of horses with wings on it. And the Prophet ﷺ became angry and he ripped it down. And you see from this, subhanAllah, that it's appropriate to show your displeasure, to set the limits when it comes to the religion. But when it comes to matters of taste and preference 
And when it comes to choices your kids make that didn't fall into the haram, don't go hard on, don't be hard on them and don't say to them, why did you do this and why didn't you do that? This is from the excellent etiquettes of the Prophet Sallallahu that he had with Anas radiallahu an. Despite the fact, and we're going to hear this in other ahadith, that Anas didn't always do what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told him to do or what the Prophet Sallallahu would have wanted him to do. He was a young boy. Sometimes he didn't get things exactly right. Sometimes your children might not get things right. But if it doesn't fall into the matters of the haram and it's not from the things that make Allah angry, then don't make it a big deal. Don't make a big fuss out of it. Don't say you know bad words towards them and don't criticize them and second guess them in matters that aren't related to the religion. As for the matters of the religion here, deserves for you to be firm, for you to set the limits, for you to be clear about what's allowed and what's not allowed. But so many times in their life, you, your children are going to make decisions, things they want for themselves, they want to buy for themselves or they want to do for themselves. Don't be hard on your kids when it comes to matters that don't relate to the halal and the haram. And I guess what this hadith really tells us is it talks to us about two things which I think are vital. Number one, that when you do, when you are giving tarbiyah to your kids, when you're nurturing your kids and educating them, that you do so with the best of manners. Because look at what stuck with Anas, subhanAllah, it wasn't just the words the Prophet Sallallahu said, it's even the words he didn't say. It's not just what he said, it's that he never ever raised his voice to me. He never said to me, oof. He never said to me, why this, why not that? SubhanAllah, when it was the matters of the religion, the Prophet ﷺ took it seriously. So the first is the excellent manners when educating your kids. The second principle is al-awlawiyat, having levels of importance. Some things are important, some things are less important. We talked about this in the husband with his wife. If you pull your wife up for every little thing, you're going to end up divorcing. If you pull her up for every little small thing that you don't like. So the kids are the same. You can't, you know, you can't pull your kids up for every small thing you don't like. Save your displeasure for what's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't worry about the things of preference and choice. Generally speaking, don't give your kids a hard time in those, in those particular issues. So that's our first principle. Our second hadith we have is a hadith of Abi Umama from his own statement. I mean, this is not, uh, or it is uh, better or more authentic as a statement of Abi Umama, radiallahu an, that he said, he said, make the servants of Allah love Allah. Make Allah beloved to his servants. Make Allah beloved to his servants. Have a think. If you've got more than one person watching this video at home, have a chat to the people around you, discuss it, come together and see if you can take a principle from this. Make Allah beloved to his servants. So inshallah you had to think about that. I take from this is in the tarbiyah that you give your children, especially as it relates to Islam, make your children love Islam. Don't make your children run away from Islam. Don't make something Islam something burdensome for them and something hard and something that they run away from. And you can take this also from the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tunaffiru. Make things easy for people and don't make it difficult for people. And make, give people glad tidings, make people feel good and don't make them run away. Now that doesn't mean that we compromise on our religion. It doesn't mean that we, um, we compromise in a way where we, we take away some of the things that are haram and we kind of you know, ignore them and let our kids do them because then they'll come to love Allah. But we want our children to love Islam, to love the Quran, to love studying Islam and learning about Islam. And we don't want to make our children hate Islam. And that's what we can take from the statement of Abi Umama radiallahu an, Habibullah ila ibadih. Make Allah beloved to his servants. i give an example of that. When it comes to the recitation of the Quran and reading the Quran, some parents are really, really, uh, you know, sometimes really strict with their kids in this. And they might send their children to a teacher they don't like. And the teacher is teaching them in a really harsh and rough way. And the kid ends up leaving there with a feeling that they don't like reading the Quran. And now their whole life that feeling goes with them. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't be strict with your children in teaching them the Quran. Because 
to be honest, that, that's something beloved and that's something praiseworthy and beautiful for someone to be strict with their children in terms of making sure they stick into their memorization and they take it seriously. But if it reaches the stage where your children start to hate reading the Quran and they start to hate going to the masjid or they start to hate studying Islam, then really as a parent, that's something wrong with that tarbiyah. You should make your children love Allah. Make your children love Islam. Make Islam the most exciting and the most interesting thing. And one of the things we can take uh, in this is rewarding your children, rewarding your children in relation to Islam, making Islam exciting and rewardable. So often we reward our children as it relates to the worldly life. You pass your exams, you get a party, a reward, you know, you get, a, you know, to buy something, you get some money. But when it comes to Islam, it's like we make it bitter for them and hard for them. But instead, you should reward your children for Islam, make them enjoy it. And I know there is an issue of ikhlas, which we have to develop in our children. And we don't want them to be living off of rewards, like in the sense where they don't feel like the need to do anything for Allah because they just want, if you're going to reward me, I'm going to do it. But in the beginning, when they're young, make them love Allah, make them love Islam. And from this is even celebrating the a'yad, the days of Eid, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, and making a big deal of it and really making the children enjoy and love it. So the children learn to love Islam and love Allah Azza wa Jal. Make Allah beloved to his servants. And I feel this is something many parents out of, uh, maybe out of a love for their children, they go wrong in this. They want good for them, so they're strict and they're tough and they push them. But sometimes they push them to the state where they, they start to, to, they stop having that love for Islam and that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you see that, you need to adjust your tarbiyah. Yes, there's got to be some strictness in there. There's got to be some sternness in there. But you have to adjust it to the level where you still see your children have that love and that desire for learning Islam and that love of Allah and that love of Islam. Our next uh, evidence we're going to take from an ayah in Surah Al-Furqan. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Those who say, Our Lord, give for us from our wives and our children those who are a pleasure to our eyes and make us for the muttaqeen and imam, make us imams, examples for the muttaqeen, for the people of taqwa. So again, if you've got people watching this video with you, have a chat, have a discussion, try and come up with where you think this ayah, where do you think this ayah fits into the principles of tarbiyah. I don't just want the dua, I want a, a principle of tarbiyah here. Um, and if you're by yourself, then have a think, jot down some ideas, pause the video, and inshallah, we'll give you the answer after that. So inshallah ta'ala, you had a think about it. Uh, here, I believe that the, the reason I brought this ayah is for the last part, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama. In every aspect of tarbiyah, the parent should be an example for their children. And it's so sad to see that many times, and, and it's from, I, I believe it's from, it's from the goodness that the parent wants good for their child. But sometimes, subhanAllah, the parent wants good for their child and they don't want it for themselves. And they sort of encourage their children to do good, but they don't encourage themselves. Now, we're not going to say in that situation that the parent should stop doing good. You know, stop doing good, stop telling your children to do good. That's not what we mean. But what we do say is that as a parent, you want to be an example for your children. And that is one of the greatest means of tarbiyah. One of the, in fact, it, it could even be considered to be one of the most fundamental parts of tarbiyah is that you as a parent have to be an example for your child. You can't be telling your child, aqim is salah, wa'mur bil ma'roof, wanha'anil munkar, wasbir ala ma asabak, perform the prayer and order that which is good and forbid that which is evil and be patient over what happens to you if you yourself don't do those things. Now, don't get me wrong, you telling your children and not doing it is still better than you not doing it and being silent. That's the worst situation. The worst situation is you do nothing and don't tell anyone to do anything either. You know, at least it's a little bit better that you tell them, but you're not doing it yourself. But unless you are an example to your children and for your children, then ultimately that tarbiyah is not going to be achieved in the way that you want it. 
And you might think that looks like a mountain that is very hard to climb. How am I going to be an example for my children? How am I going to start doing these things? I'm not doing these right now. Learn with your kids. Be honest with your kids. Sit down with your children and talk to them and say to them, look, I know I'm not really doing what I should be doing right now, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to help me out. We're going to learn together. And subhanAllah, you start. And maybe you miss a day, you lose a day, you forget something, you fall into something, but you keep going back to your children. You're being honest. And one of the most, one of the greatest things we can instill in our children is honesty and truthfulness as an example from ourselves and to them. So you're trying to be an example for your kids. And you sit down with your kids and say, look, I know I'm not doing exactly what I should be doing right now, but I'm going to try and we're going to learn together. And if it's about learning Islam, learn together. Go to classes with your kids together. And subhanAllah, you might see that your children learn benefits that you didn't learn. And they take on knowledge that you weren't able to take on because their mind is more suited to it. And their abilities are greater to absorb that information. And there's no harm in you learning then from them. Didn't Ibrahim say to his father, Ya abati, inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tika fattabi'ni ahdika siratan sawiyya. Oh my father, there has come to me knowledge that has not come to you. So follow me and I will guide you to a straight path. SubhanAllah, we can learn from our children. There's nothing wrong with that. If our children have learned, we come together and learn together as a family. And this is one of the goals that we had behind this course and all of the courses that we were uh, providing via Al Madrasa Tul Umariya and particularly the AMAU at Home initiative, just to get the families together, learning together. And then, subhanAllah, slowly you will see the parents become that example of taqwa. As for the parents being an example, this has to happen. La mahala. You can't get out of it. You are an example to your children. Whatever you do, your children are going to pick up on your habits, your things, the things you say, the things you do. There's no escape from that. But here we want to be an example of taqwa, not an example of evil or an example of uh, sinfulness or an example of disobedience, but an example of taqwa. As for you being an example, you can't escape that. Every child takes their parents as an example. Even the children, the teenagers, when they start getting a bit boisterous and a little bit, you know, and they say that, I don't, oh, I don't want to be like my dad or I don't want to be like my mom, or they try to like rebel a little bit, but wallah, they still take their parents as an example. They take their parents as an example. So be an example for a taqwa. Be an example for taqwa. Don't be an example for, uh, for something bad or something wrong. Our next hadith that we have is a hadith from Amr ibn Shu'ayb and Abihi an Jaddihi. Radi Allahu ta'ala anhu arda. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Muru awladakum bis salah, wa hum abana u sab'i sinin. Wadribuhum alayha wa hum abana u ashri sinin. وَفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Amr ibn Shu'ayb narrated from his father, from his father's grandfather, who is Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhumah, command your children to pray when they are at seven years of age and hit them in order to, for them to pray when they are ten years of age and separate them at that age, at ten years, separate between them in their beds. What benefit are you going to take from this? What principle of tarbiyah? There's many benefits you could take, 10, 20 benefits from this hadith, but what principle of tarbiyah are you going to take from this hadith? We had alluded to it in previous lectures, maybe I mentioned it briefly, so you might have caught that. So have a chat with, it, with the people around you, have a discussion and see if you can come up with the answer, inshallah. So hopefully you've had time to think about that, inshallah. The principle I take here is, there are two principles you can take from this particular, that, that I saw, you may have found others and you may have found better ones than the ones that I found, but particularly age-specific tarbiyah, that your tarbiyah needs to change and adapt to the child's age. So here the Prophet gives specific instructions with regard to the salah as it relates to the child who's seven years old and specific instructions as it relates to the salah for the child who is 10 years old. The second principle that I would take from this is that you need to be ahead of the curve as it relates to your child. And that is because as it relates to the salah, what, at what age does the child earn sin if they don't pray? At what age is the child sinful if they don't pray? Puberty, right? You don't earn sin before puberty. And let's just say puberty, 14 years old, 
let's just, let's just put a, a, an approximate average figure of 14 years old on the age of puberty. So until the child reaches 14 years old, they are not sinful for leaving the prayer. So why are we disciplining them at 10 years old? Why are we telling them at seven years old, pray, come on, pray, salah time, come on, pray, pray, pray. And then if they say no at 10 years old, we're disciplining them. Where's that coming from if the child is not sinful until 14? Because as a parent, you are obliged to be ahead of the curve. Your tarbiyah must precede the time when it becomes obligatory. There's no point teaching your child about the etiquettes as it relates to the opposite gender after the horse has already bolted from the stable and you know you then you close the then you close the stable door you you bolt the stable door after the horse has already left there, there's no benefit to that as a parent you have to be ahead of the curve so you have to be teaching and giving that tarbiyah to your child before it becomes an obligation on them and that's why this hadith implies that you would teach them how to pray before seven years old so if we put this hadith in order we have four ages we have before seven years old, we have at seven years old, we have at 10 years old, and we have at 14, approximately, puberty, 14 years old, approximately. So how does this work? Before seven years old, we teach them how to pray, because how can we command them to pray if we haven't taught them how to pray? How can I say to a seven-year-old, come on, fetch your time, pray. Stara, what's praying? I don't know, what, what do I do? What do I say? Obviously, I have to have taught him before that. Okay, now at seven years old, I'm telling him, come and pray. But sometimes he or she, they might say, Dad, I don't want to pray. I know I don't want to pray. I'm not going to pray. So we let it go. When there's between seven and 10, we let it go. But it's on a sliding scale. It's not like and the day before the 10th birthday, we say to them, okay, let it go. And then on the 10th birthday, we say, come and pray. It's not like that. That doesn't work, right? You have to have a sliding scale where you get more and more serious as they get older and older. But by the time they reach 10 years old, now we're gonna discipline them. And that this uh, principle we can take from this, a third principle we can take from this hadith is the right of the parent to discipline their child. And that disciplining your child within the limits set by Islam is an important part of tarbiyah, that you discipline them. Like the Prophet said, hit them. If they don't pray from 10 years old. So now we have a next phase, which is a phase of discipline. And that shows you it begins with educating them. After we educated the child, now we are requesting the child. After we requested the child, now we're going to discipline the child. And now upon that, then the child reaches that stage of being regular in the prayer way before the time when the prayer is actually sinful for them. Because your discipline as a parent, you're not going to hit them hard. You're not going to make them you know, hurt themselves or something like that. It's the same kind of discussion that we had when we talked about the man and his wife and so on. But here, when you discipline your children, you're disciplining them, which is better for them, that you discipline them and teach them at 10 years old or that they are punished by Allah, Yawm al Qiyamah. Isn't it more befitting that we should discipline our children before Allah Azzawajal punishes them and us for our shortcomings as it relates to our children? So here we have teaching, we have sort of inviting or encouraging, then we have discipline, and all of that comes before the Islamic obligation actually comes into play. So this hadith is one of the most beneficial ahadith that we have, which educates us and informs us about the tarbiyah of our children, and it contains many principles and benefits uh, relating to that. Our next hadith, an Aisha radiallahu anha, زوج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال إن الرفق لا يكون في شيء إلا زانه ولا ينزع من شيء إلا شانه Aisha narrated the wife of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم she narrated from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that he said softness was never put into anything except that it made it beautiful and it was never taken out of anything except that it made it ugly gentleness, softness, رفق and this one is an easy one to get. I'm not going to ask you to think about it. It's the principle that our tarbiyah should be mabniya. It should be built upon arrifq walin. Gentleness, softness, and being easy going with people. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was told, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ and if you were harsh and hard-hearted, they would have ran from, among, um, from around you. By the mercy of Allah, you were gentle with them. 
If you were harsh and you were hard-hearted, they would have fled from around you. So the principle is that of softness and gentleness. Does that mean that we never get angry? Does that mean we never shout? Doesn't mean that. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the Prophet ﷺ got angry. When the limits of Allah were crossed, he would show his anger. But our basic principle with our children is not anger. Our basic principle with our children is not screaming or shouting. Our basic principle with them is softness and gentleness and kindness and ease. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned from among the people that the fire is prohibited for. Allah has made the fire haram for them and them haram for the fire. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned كُلُّ هَيِّنٍ لَيِّنٍ سَهْلٍ قَرِيبٍ Everyone who is easy going and gentle and soft with the people and near approachable and that's how a parent should be. They should be soft, they should be gentle, they should be approachable, they should be friendly, they should be kind. That's how we should be with our children. And there is a time for discipline and there's a time for raising the voice. And that's why the Prophet said, وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا Hit them if they don't pray at 10 years old. There's a time for discipline, there's a time for raising the voice, there's a time for getting angry. But the basic way we deal with our children should be one of gentleness and softness. Our next text that we have, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِيَسْتَأْذِنْكُمُ الَّذِينَ مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَبْلُغُوا الْحُلُومَ مِنْكُمْ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتٍ من قبل صلاة الفجر وحين تضعون ثيابكم من الظهيرة ومن بعد صلاة العشاء ثلاث عورات لكم ليس عليكم ولا عليهم جناح بعدهن طوافون عليكم بعضكم على بعض كذلك يبين الله لكم الآيات والله عليم حكيم سورة النور آية نمبر 58 let those who your right hands possess and those that haven't reached the age of puberty, let them make istidhan. Let them knock on your door and ask permission to enter. Let them ask permission to enter from you at three times. After, before the Fajr prayer and when you take off your clothes to go to sleep in your vahira, in the, the morning time when you have the nap in the day, and after Salatul Isha, after the Isha prayer, three awrat for you, three private times, times where you have your privacy. There is no harm upon you or upon them after those and in any other time that they come and they visit you, they come and see you. Ba'dukum ala ba'd, yani some of you to others. And in this way, Allah makes His ayat clear to you and Allah is Alim and Hakim. We're running a little bit short on time on this one, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. First of all, that tarbiyah includes teaching your children adab, etiquettes and manners and how to behave. So it includes teaching your children things like knocking on the door to ask permission and, and, uh, and so on. And the second benefit that I wanted to take from this is that part of the tarbiyah is that we teach our children al-haya, we teach them, uh, we teach them uh, shyness and modesty. And we don't, in front of, you know, sort of, we take responsibility for the awrat, the, the, the times of privacy and the way that we dress in front of our children and we behave in front of our children. So it's really important that our tarbiyah is based upon modesty and that we teach them modesty and we teach them in everything that they do, we teach them modesty. And we teach them the basic etiquettes and manners that, that they're going to need when they interact with people later on. And one of these simple ones is al-istidhan that is mentioned in Surah An-Nur. Just knocking on the door and asking permission, can I come in before Fajr, after Isha, when the person goes to sleep in the middle of the day, knocking on the door and the child saying, can I come in to the parents' room, for example? This is a beautiful etiquette and it's about teaching our children adab, that our tarbiyah shouldn't just be teaching them about the ibadat, uh, that are in terms of salah and zakah and so on, but also teaching them about the adab, about manners, and about how to behave with other people and how to interact with other people, and particularly the issue of modesty and haya in everything they do. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ saw a man who was criticizing his brother about modesty. He was giving him a hard time over modesty, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Da'hu, leave him alone. فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ خَيْرٌ كُلُّهُ Everything about modesty is good. Leave him alone because everything about modesty is good. Everything about modesty is good. So I believe that that is worth highlighting, even though there's many adab that we teach our children, but the adab of modesty 
and particularly that we teach our children part of the tarbiyah as we teach them how to behave with other people. And if they don't learn how to behave like that within their family, then how can we expect them to learn to behave like that outside of it? Does that make sense? How can we hope for them to have good behavior when it comes to the guests and when it comes to um when it comes to when they live, you know, they go out to the real world and they, you know, they mix with people. At the end of the day, if they don't learn that from the family, from the family, then where are they going to learn it from? Our last hadith for this episode is a hadith of Umar bin Abi Salama, radiallahu an, and he said, he said, "Kuntu fi hajri Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa kanat yadi tatishu fi sahfa." فقال لي يا غلام سم الله وكل بيمينك وكل مما يليك. Said he's narrated in Bukhari and Muslim from the Hadith of Umar ibn Abi Salama that he said that I was in the apartment of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and my hand was going all around the tray, all around the plate. I was taking food from the far side of the plate and from the near side of the plate. So he said to me, O oh young boy, سم الله, say بسم الله. And eat with your right hand and eat from what is near to you. I'm going to take just a few benefits as it relates to tarbiyah here, just as we conclude the episode. First of all, that the parent should not la yajuz ta'khir al bayan an waqt al haja. It's not allowed for you to delay teaching your children what they need when the time is there that they need it. You know, at that time he was doing something wrong. The Prophet didn't delay and say, oh, I'll deal with it when he's older, I'll deal with it in 10 years' time, 5 years' time, 2 years' time, 2 weeks' time. He said to him, oh, young boy, say the name of Allah and eat with your right hand and eat with what is near to you. And also from the benefits we can take from this is you teach your children everything that you think they will need. Here, uh, Umar ibn Abi Salama, he mentions that he made one mistake, which is that his hand was going all over. His hand was going all over. And yet the Prophet ﷺ taught him three etiquettes, saying Bismillah, eating with the right hand and eating from that which is near to you for the benefit to be greater. So you look at what you think your children will need. You don't just teach them the one thing if they did something wrong, not just one, that one thing only, but you try to widen it to the other things you think they might need on a similar topic. And again, look at the beautiful way that the Prophet ﷺ addressed this and the beautiful way the Prophet ﷺ spoke about this. That's all we have time for in this episode. In the next episode, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be talking about how you teach your children Islam. Because we've talked about tarbiyah generally, and now we're going to go on to specific nasiha from me. Uh, as relates to how you should teach your children Islam and how you should go about teaching Islam to your children. Where do you start and how do you teach them? That's coming up in the next episode, inshallah ta'ala. And we are also going to talk about in a future episode, inshallah, as it relates to teaching your children in the worldly life and educating your children and things like homeschooling or educating your children at home or how you can play a part in your children's worldly uh, education. But before that, we're going to put Islam first. We're going to talk about Islamic education for children and that's coming up in the next episode. And Allah knows best. Was salatu was salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amau at home dot com